Welcome back, everybody, and welcome back to yet another video on this overall unit that we've been exploring, the the Gilded Age, this last quarter century of um, the 19th century. And this time, we're going to take a particular focus on the emergence of the modern American city, which happened to emerge um, during that period, during the Gilded Age. Well, as I've said in class already, urbanization, meaning um, not just uh, <clears throat> the, the appearance of cities, but the growth of cities, but also the growing trend of more and more of the population shifting towards cities. And why was this happening? It was happening because of industrialization, okay? Uh, that's that's where the factories were showing up. The factories were showing up because that's where the people were, and because that's where the people were, um, they were there for jobs, and this caused um, well incredible migrations and shifts in American society. Um, rural people that found it, you know harder and harder to find. And we're talking about landless rural people that found it harder and harder to find work because they were displaced by machinery. Are heading towards the cities um it's not just rural americans but also people in circ similar circumstances in other countries are also heading towards the cities um <clears throat> and before you know it not is not only is our population growing by leaps and bounds but uh, the vast majority of this growth is happening in what we call our urban centers so to give you an idea um, to go along with this map and so, you know, with industrialization comes urbanization, long story short, short, a growing trend towards more and more people living in urban areas because that's where the new industrial jobs are. Long story short, uh, U.S. population in 1960 was 31 million. By 1900, we're at 76 million. That's more than double. And keep in mind that a quarter of that growth, about 45 million, uh, how about the quarter of that growth comes from 12 million immigrants? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if the math is absolutely right there, but yes, you know, about a quarter of that growth from 31 million to 76 million, um, 12 million immigrants during that period. So, you know, immigrants, and they're coming to the cities. Why? They're coming for jobs. And a lot of them are also coming to escape. Um, rural life or small town life the city offers amenities offers uh, opportunities other than jobs that small towns just don't have and it's the same trend today who's the one who are the ones who are the ones that are not just heading towards the cities but who are the ones leaving their countries they're young people often young women and young families um more information about this period you know what, what are the cities we're talking about what are the cities that are emerging as you know the metropolises of gilded age america of course new york city new york city in 1860 had a little over a million people we're talking about new york city and, the, and the, all of its boroughs a little tricky because brooklyn was once considered a different city at one time by the time we get to 1900 you're talking about more than triple the population 3.4 million people uh, Philadelphia went from half a million people in 1860 to over a million people. Um, true, by today's standards, these are not large numbers, but by the standards of the Gilded Age, these are huge numbers. <clears throat> Boston, Baltimore, Cincinnati, St. Louis, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, um, you name it. Usually these industrial towns, these are the, that's where all the growth was happening. Even when we talk again about this shift from rural to urban populations in 1860, about 25 million of our 30 million Americans, about 25 million of them more or less, were rural and about 6 million were urban, at least lived in urban centers. By the time we get to 1900, it shifted significantly. Already we have, we're still primarily rural, but you know, we're getting close to half and half, you know, 40, 46 million people are rural, but 30 million people are urban. 
Okay, and that's just what in a forty year span between eighteen sixty and by the time we get to nineteen twenty, we finally cross the threshold and you actually have more people living in urban centers that you do in rural parts of the United States. Before we leave, um, that's one of the earliest skyscrapers in New York City. It's called the Flatiron Building, and it was made possible thanks to the innovation of steel beams in construction. Uh, steel is, is not only lighter, but more durable. It could take on more weight. And for the first time, the American city was able to reach heights, no pun intended, uh, the likes of which it was never able to do before. And especially when you're talking about places like Manhattan. Manhattan is in, in New York City, which is one of the boroughs, the, the principal borough. You're talking about an island, an island that's only about 40 square miles. When millions and millions and millions of people start showing up looking for living space, at some point, the only direction to go is up. And that's why we see New York and Chicago start to go up up to create living space for people it usually has something to do chicago's not so much the case but absolutely new york has to do with scarcity of land <clears throat> and here's a, a, a nice colorized picture but you know a, a a a a street scene of the gilded age with gilded age um architecture one of the nicer parts in town of, of town, most likely New York City. A lot of these, you'd be surprised how many of these buildings are still around. Um, and who lived in in the cities? You know, it, it was you know it, it was either the very wealthy who wanted to be in the center of all, or the very poor that was ne that were needed to be there because that's where the factories were as well. And despite a lack of modern day necessities, things that we take for granted today. Listen, the city of the Gilded Age, for a good chunk of its existence, you know, lacked electrification. You know, we're not going to start electrifying cities until the 1880s. Modern stool sewer systems, not until 1900. Indoor plumbing, water treatment plants. Okay, in the 1870s, we don't start chlorinating water until 1908. Unsafe or contaminated water was a common problem in many of these cities. Garbage collection, as well as professional modern full-time police and fire departments these things didn't exist would come into existence during the gilded age and yet nonetheless the populations grew cities swelled both in size and in population and that's some of the that would be some of the gilded age mansions that we would talk about and some of the more you know the nicer parts of town remember you know it's either the wealthy that live in the city center um or the very poor um new opportunities cities offered new opportunities um for leisure for example central park is finished in 1876 by the way they don't mention this you know an african-american community was raised to the ground in order to build central park just so you know Chicago, uh, the Columbian World's, Fa uh, World's Fair and Exposition of 1893, also known the, as the White City. And this place has incredible history. Incredible history. Um, it was the site of the World's Fair. It was the site of a struggle between Edison and Westinghouse to electrify the World's Fair. It opens up right in the panic of 1893 but millions of people visit the white city um there's so much to say about that particular world's fair in that particular year luna park one of the first amusement parks in the united states that opened up in what we call coney island in brooklyn in new york city so you know that's one of the things that attracted people to the cities other than jobs you know what else you know what, what other opportunities were there for leisure already we were playing baseball boxing was a working man's sport that was looked down upon by you know the higher classes you had theater you had theater for the higher classes and then you had you know vaudeville you had um <clears throat> burlesque theaters for the more working class um, people are starting to discover the beach in very strange ways, as you can see in that picture. <laughs> That's, I guess, that was a day at the beach.
um, during the Gilded Age. You know, but if you're working, you know, 12, 14 hours, it's not like you have a whole lot of time to do any of those things anyway. And as the city grows and expands, uh, you need to move people around. You got to get people from work to home and from home to work. And we're talking about a time in, in history which the distances were relatively short. And so cities began to pioneer um, new ways in which to move people around. Um, the elevated railway. We have metro rail crying out loud the first elevated railways uh, were built in the 1870s and you're like actually running a train through the city on an elevated track horse-drawn streetcars as you can see down there those were you know before we had buses that's what we had um and then we went green think about this back in the 1880s we already had green public transportation we had electric streetcars that came to replace um, the horse-drawn streetcars, subways. Boston opened up its first subway line, which they basically ran on an electric streetcar through a tube uh, they drilled in the ground. In, in 1897, we wouldn't have the first real, what we would recognize as paved concrete roads until 1909. Um, but these were all innovations that were implemented in the cities. Oh, I can't forget. The bicycle, the first modern safety bicycle, a bicycle that you would recognize as a bicycle, they don't emerge until about the 1880s, 1890s, all means of transportation. And so what about the poor? What about the millions that are working those 12, 14 hour days? Well, for them, um, we need to find places for them to live and we got to make it cheap and we got to make it so that we could stuff as many of them in, in there as possible. And thus emerges the, the famous tenements. Um, <clears throat> as you can see from the facades, very common in northern American cities, the working poor lived in crowded tenement buildings. At first, they were quickly built to accommodate large numbers of working families flooding into these cities from overseas, from, from rural parts of the country, from small towns. They were, the construction was not the best. Quite often, they lacked many necessities, um, overcrowding, lack of plumbing, heating and ventilation were common. Um, as was eventually crime and disease and unsanitary and unsafe living conditions. But this is where the working poor with their meager wages were expected to live their lives. In fact, most working poor experienced increased infant mortality, increased death rates from disease because of the problem of contaminated water, which was commonplace in, in cities back then, as well as lower fertility rates. Time, lack of maintenance, and deteriorated conditions often left tenements as housing for the poorest of the working poor, immigrants. And it's in, in these communities, these rundown tenements that would become the, the hub, the nucleus of our earliest immigrant communities. And, you know, they have a great museum in New York if you ever have a chance. The, you know, they have one that, you know, they kept up for people to come and look at the tenement museum. But yes, these places were once commonplace, as you can see here from these various pictures of that era. So let's talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about immigration, the history of immigration in the United States. And the United States has always prided itself to be a country that attracts large numbers of immigrants from the very beginning. And why is that? Because uh, the United States happens to be one of those countries that just so happens to offer, not only have a relatively open door, you know, compared to other countries, but to offer opportunities for, well, a, a number of things. I mean, you know, to economically better oneself. Um, people also come here, you know, running away from persecution, et cetera, et cetera. I want to talk about two waves that happened in the 19th century. Two waves of immigrants, as you can see there. You have the old, the old immigrants that 
I, 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 there's actually three waves, and I don't want to talk about the mostly British and Welsh and Scots, uh, English Scots and Welsh that came, that came in, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Around the mid 1800s, you know, we start getting a lot of folks from Central Europe, okay, some Northern Europeans as well. It's a continuation of you know uh, of English and Welsh and Scots. Um, but then as the 19th century gives way to the last couple of decades, the, the, the latter 19th century, um, the character of, of our immigration begins to change. And we start getting a lot more people from Central and Southern Europe. <clears throat> uh, as you can see in that map, there's also Asian immigration. And we're going to talk in more detail from that, but the United States and not a not a huge number compared to the Europeans that came over, but there's significant numbers of of Chinese uh, immigrants that came to the United States, and we've talked about them. You know, they start showing up in the 1840s uh, for the railroads and, and 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 mining, and then other Asian immigrants follow them as well. But as you can see that map, the lion's share of immigration that comes to the United States in the 19th century is European. If you're curious about that arrow coming from the South, no Latin Americans at this time in history were not emigrants. They did not tend to immigrate to the United States in bridge large numbers. In fact, many of these countries of Latin America at that time were actually countries that attracted immigrants. For example, Brazil attracted a lot of uh, Germans and Italians. Uh, so did Argentina and Chile. Uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic, actually were countries that attracted immigrants once upon a time. A lot of uh, Lebanese and Syrians and people from Central Europe, um, Central America, attracted a lot of immigrants also from the Middle East. Uh, these are the, the famous Turcos, as they're referred to in, in, um, in, in Central America. So that, that's the interesting part. Latin America tended to attract immigrants in this, uh, you know, during the 19th century, rather than, with the exception of Mexico, because there's a shared border. Um, when, if there's a significant group of people from south of the border, other than Mexicans that came into the United States in the late Gilded Age, it would be people from what we call the West Indies. Basically, um, people of African descent from the English-speaking um, <clears throat> Caribbean, Bahamas, Bermuda, Jamaica, uh, the Antilles, Trinidad and Tobago, believe it or not, okay, is where I'm going to surprise you, that's the roots of Miami's African-American community. Ameri Afri Miami's African-American community has immigrant roots, as in immigrants that came from the Bahamas during this period. But this is the classic story, right? Let's go to this, this wave of Europeans that came to the United States um, in the mid to late 1800s. <clears throat> that first wave, <clears throat> these were the Germans that came in very, very large numbers and some Scandinavians as well. They tended to be somewhat educated. Many of them were political exiles. Many brought you know, had capital and they came here to buy land and go into farming, but not necessarily so. And, you know, they're going to form the bulk of the immigrant community for the most part in Midwestern states like Wisconsin and Illinois, et cetera, et cetera. Then give a, a couple of decades and we begin to experience a new wave of immigrants. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, these were coming from, oh, and I forgot to mention before we move on, and between the 1840s and 1880s, uh, alongside the Germans, we also had a significant number of Irish coming over to the United States. The Irish, unlike the Germans, did tend to be poor and uneducated, and the majority of them are fleeing the potato famine, which started in 1842 and lasted until 1852. And at the end of the story, we're going to have more Irishmen living in the United States than were left in Ireland. Now back to this new wave that starts jump starts in the 1880s and, and, and continues through towards um, the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of Italians, a lot of Russians. A lot of these Russians are Russian Jews that are escaping religious persecution. A lot of Poles, Hungarians, and Greeks. Um, 
<clears throat> and of course, you know, as always, there's always anti-immigrant kickback. Were the Germans more accepted than this new group? Sure, because the Germans uh, were closer to what you would, you know, Northern European. And yes, there was racism at that time and discrimination. And, you know, many of these Germans, not all of them were, you know, Protestants. They were Lutherans. And so um, <clears throat> what they would call native born americans at the time were more accepting than when these new groups were coming and this is something that we have to understand okay i'm going to say it now what is white or what has always been considered white in this country has always been figurative it's always been fluid it's always meant it's always been as much about class than about skin color okay and it shocks a lot of people when i tell them you know what <clears throat> the late 19th century these italians russian jews hungarians eastern europeans they may consider themselves white today but mainstream american society white society did not consider them white back then all right so again, this, 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 this concept is a construct, and it's a very fluid one, and it's a very figurative one. It changes over the years, and it has just as much to do about mobility and access and economics than it does about skin color, okay? It's, 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 in, it's, it's fluid and in motion today, for crying out loud. Um, I mean, even the Irish were not considered white at one time by other whites so that's that's something that we need to be very careful about because race does figure in very distinctly um in the history of this country's immigration and especially when we look at opportunities that were closed to immigrants for one reason or another discrimination yeah you have to look into those things not only not always racial discrimination but there was also ethnic discrimination as well absolutely as well as class discrimination um these folks that came in the second wave were not as educated as those Germans that came after the 1840s. They were poor. They tended to be rural themselves. And it was not as easy for them to establish themselves. Catholicism, the fact that they were Jewish, uh, worked against them in a mostly Protestant country. Um, <clears throat> and many of them found themselves having to work the lowest paying jobs in these factories and would have a harder time uh blending into the american fabric uh, making something of themselves getting a foothold if you will than other groups did they would it just took longer it was more difficult so what are we looking at here we're looking at ellis island ellis island if you don't know was the number one processing center for European immigrants arriving to the United States. It was opened up in 1892 and stayed open until 1924. It was a pretty simple process. You showed up, by the way, let's just say immigration and naturalization laws at this time were very, very relaxed at the request of business. Business actually wanted very relaxed immigration laws because they wanted to bring in as they, they they needed people the more factories opened up the more jobs opened up and they needed to staff these factories hence they needed washington to keep immigration laws as flexible as possible this was a period which it was extremely easy to immigrate to the united states quite often these industries had agents in europe recruiting people okay they paid for the trip companies recruited people in europe to come to the united states to live and work okay so much was the labor shortage in the united states that businesses had to go overseas to attract people to come over okay and hence immigration laws were very relaxed you showed up probably because you know a company sponsored you or the trips were cheap by the way they were not as expensive as they would have been 100 years earlier for example 
and physical, a short interview, might take a day if they think you might be sick, and as long as you're not mentally ill, or, or an alcoholic, or something of that nature, welcome to the United States, it was that easy. Only 2% of the people that ever walked through Ellis Island, and we're talking about millions of people, made their way to the United States through Ellis Island. Only 2% were ever sent back home. It was a very different story for immigrants back then compared to today. Was there, was there, was there pushback? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I, you know, I, I, I was hoping to surprise you because I was going to ask the class. Like, like, if you think about, you know, the story of uh, what you imagine of immigration in, in this country, and if I were to ask you, see, I ruined it right now. If I was going to ask you, what do you think is the number one country uh, that, is, that has brought immigrants to the United States? And most people will say, well, Italians or Irish. No, it's been Germans. By and large. And there's a good reason why it's not so obvious. Number one, let's just say it's been easier for them over the years to blend into mainstream white Anglo-Saxon society because, well, physically, there's pretty much no difference at all. Uh, the fact that many of them were Protestants made it very easy as well, or they were Lutherans. Um, and there's also other reasons, and they have to do with World War One and World War Two. why German-Americans deliberately erased a lot of their ethnic and cultural markers, and it was to avoid uh, negative attention. In some cases, even persecution at the hands of average Americans while we were at war with Germans, uh, with Germany, with the German Empire, or or the Nazis. But yes, Germans number one. Up in, in this in this graph ends in in, in 1985. Germany was the country. And that's kind of funny because Germany didn't really exist as a country until about the late 1870s, 1880s. So what we're really talking about are people from Germanic states. But nonetheless, let's not nitpick because we could say the same thing about Italians. Um, yes, then Italians would be the second largest group. And this, the, the difference is whereas the Germans end up being such a large group because they steadily came in large numbers over a long period of time. The Italians came in huge numbers during a shorter period of time. Okay, between nine, just those 10 years of the 19th century, we would have, a, you know, an incredible, you know, wave of Italians coming over to the United States. Great Britain, but that was always the case, fired by the Irish, Canadians, but, you know, there's always been a common border, Russians, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an interesting map. Um, kind of squint our eyes you know, where are they going where are they going to live proportion of foreign born to total population a map of the 1900s and the redder areas are areas in which 34 percent or more of the population is foreign born and you squint your eyes and it's easy to see you're talking about new york and massachusetts you're talking about you know chicago and milwaukee and and all up there in michigan and and even you know North Dakota, and yes, you know, California as well. That's um, that's where most of the immigrants are are heading to, and they're and if 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 I'm seeing that, I'm also seeing cities. They're heading towards the cities, particularly that latter wave, because that's where the jobs are. This is another interesting map. This is, I guess, it's already dated. Um, this is the 2000 census. So we're talking about a census that's already about 20 years old in which they asked people, you know, what do you know about your the history of your family, your ethnic, you know, what do you identify? Other than, you know, American, what, you know, what ethnicity do you identify? What ancestry do you identify with? All that light blue is German. So when I tell you that Germans ended up being the number one immigrant group of all time, you know, in the history of the United States, and you look at this map, it is what it is. It speaks for itself.
you're talking about a huge number of Americans that trace their ancestry back to Germany. Are there other groups? Sure. Those folks in yellow, they say they're American. So that means that they, they don't know or they don't care to know. So we just leave them alone. And purple is, is the black belt. That's where it's still the concentration of African Americans. Pink is Mexico. But of course, that's to be expected. There's a shared border. Um, some interesting ones up there. Um, Finnish. We see some Finnish and we see some Norwegian up there. Yes. Um, up there in, in, in the upper Dakotas and Michigan and Minnesota, uh, a lot of uh, Scandinavians came a lot of, into the lumber business. Why else do you think we have the Minnesota Vikings? That was not by mistake. Okay, that was deliberate. Yes, sports teams sometimes say a lot about our history. We've talked about that before. Uh, we see our blues. Italians are a huge ethnic. You know, a lot of people identify with being Italian. Purple, we have, you know, the Irish. Um, it's funny, you know, even up there in Vermont, New Hampshire, we have people that it's not really French. It's 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 Quebec because Quebec is across the border. <clears throat> and, you know, with immigrants, we have the ethnic enclave, the ethnic neighborhood. When folks came over from another country, this is this is usually step two after Ellis Island. Um, settling in a community in the neighborhood of people that, you know, they speak the language and, and, and share the same customs and the same foods. And this is where you put your foot in your door. You get your leg up um to jump into american society find a job put your kids to school raise your kids here and little by little begin the process of integrating and assimilating and eventually becoming part of american society but i will tell you there are bumps along the road particularly that latter wave of europeans let's just say were less willing or in less of a hurry and some people blame these ethnic neighborhoods to join mainstream white American society. And therefore, they held on to, well, even till today, they held on to their ethnic identities for much longer. You got, you got Italian Americans walking around New York City uh, who could trace their ancestry back to some great, great, great grandfather that came in the 1880s. They don't speak Italian, but they'll tell you they're Italian. You got a lot of Irish Americans in, in Boston that say the same thing. Okay, but there's a reason why the Irish would not want to associate themselves with, you know, Anglo-Saxon culture. Um, so, yes, these things happen. These things, some, some groups made a greater effort to assimilate, anglicize their names, if you will, gave their children American names. And some groups were more resistant toward, towards it. Um, and and <laughs> we should know about that. They centered their lives and they raised their children in these enclaves that were extensions of the home country. Okay. Not only were their neighborhoods extensions of the home country, their homes were extensions of their home country. An Italian-American home in New York City. On the other side of the door, in between those four walls, was probably no different than an Italian home in Italy. Okay? They kept the home country alive somehow, some way. And that complicates the immigrant process. First generation, by second, third, you can't hold on anymore. And, and things start to, well, drift into the mainstream. Here's a map of, well, just to prove to you just how ethnically diverse. Um, Chicago and New York, here you go. Here's a map of Chicago in the 1890s, and you'll see that Chicago is a quilt. It's made up of German neighborhoods, um, Irish neighborhoods, Polish neighborhoods in, the, in, in South Side Chicago. Of course, these have all moved around. Um, New York, New York is another tapestry. You know, you have huge chunks that are German neighborhoods, uh, Irish neighborhoods in Manhattan, Russian neighborhoods in lower Manhattan. Of course, this is all mixed up. By 1890, 87% of Chicago was immigrants and their children, which are first generation. 
80% of New York City was made up of immigrants. 84% of Milwaukee and Detroit was made up of immigrants. In fact, New York City had more Irish than Dublin, which is the capital of Ireland, and more Germans than Hamburg. Chicago had more Poles than Warsaw, which I like to say was the capital of Poland, but there was no Poland at the time. And so here's some images. Yeah, usually young men and young women coming to the United States. You know, they're strong, they have energy, um, they could do hard work and they can make some money and, and use that money as a way to, you know, climb a couple of steps up the ladder. And if they can't, then they're going to put their children through American schools with the expectation that, you know, knowing English and being educated here, their kids are going to move up the ladder. And that's that's the immigrant experience. That's the immigrant dream. Many of these immigrants came here knowing that it was going to be tough and they were going to work their backsides off. And maybe they weren't going to see much progress, but by God, their children were and their grandchildren were. And that's why they stuck it out. That's why they stuck it out. The idea was that those that are born here and they come after me, you know, I'm doing this for them. And. I imagine many of my students could absolutely relate with this experience that's been going on um, for a very long time in this country. These, these are, I believe these are Norwegian lumberjacks. Um, yeah, everybody together. More images of, you know, it was rough. Living in these tenements, very crowded. Sometimes multiple families had to share the same dwelling. But they stuck around and they did it well. Either one, either because they got here, didn't turn out the way they expected, and well, they just can't go back. Or they got here and they said, you know what, we're going to plow through and, and it should be better for our children. So we're going to stick it through. Right? Some experienced more success than others. Here's another image, you know, is. You know, if you're working, you know, very long hours at, the fa at a nearby factory, but at, work, at home there was work, you know, watching other people's children, cooking food for people that don't have time to cook at home, laundry, okay? You know, tenements organized as entire productions of, of doing laundry for their neighbors and, and line drying them between the buildings. Here's one of my favorite pictures, you know, that that's a, that's a family. Too many kids, okay. You got mom, dad, and you got five kids there. Everybody cramped into, you know, a very small dwelling with a cast iron stove providing pretty much the only heat in the winter and the ability to cook. And, of course, there was pushback. Now, you know, there, that's always been the case, right? There's always a segment of society that feels threatened, that jobs are going to be taken away, or they feel a cultural threat. These people, they're not like us. They don't worship like us. They don't speak like us. That Their customs are not like that. Somehow that's a threat to some sort of sense of purity, the purity of, of, of white Anglo-Saxon society and civilization, particularly when you're talking about the period of American history. The a significant people a, a, a amount of people bought into you know white supremacist ideology. They just took it as it is what it is, and said so you have folks coming over that you don't quite consider white. You consider them very strange and foreign, and you see them as a threat. And so, like, well, you know, there's going to be Americans that that, that want to stop this, end this. Um. So yeah, that you know, not all groups assimilated. Not only not only are groups assimilated, not all groups were actually in a rush to assimilate. Um, it's during this period that we have the hyphenated American, which some other Americans considered very offensive, like Theodore Roosevelt, for example. You know, he said you're either you're an American, you know, there's no or you're not, you know, there's no hyphenated Americans. Well, we have hyphenated Americans today. Many people around us consider themselves hyphenated Americans. And that's when it, you know, it starts. And if you're wondering about that voting, that you know, why are you know foreigners voting? Believe it or not, up until the 20th century, foreigners could vote in this country as long as they they declared that 
they had an intention of becoming citizens one day, foreigners were allowed to vote, and they did. And they influenced a lot of elections, and absolutely. And sometimes they were excluded. Sometimes um, some immigrants were more welcome than others. I mean, possibly the, the the least welcome, unfortunately, were Chinese immigrants. And 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 here we're talking about California. Uh, between 1851 and 1883, 300,000 Chinese immigrants, mostly Cantonese, well, the Europeans give it, it's, it the region is called Guangdong. Uh, that's why when, when Americans think Chinese and Chinese food and Chinese language, there's kind of a mistake there. It's because the vast, vast, vast majority of Chinese that came to this country in the late 1900s came from South China. And in South China, they speak Cantonese. Uh, the culture is Cantonese, or what should more accurately be called, you know, Guangdong. And that's our association is wrong. It, what we assume to be Chinese is actually it's very regional. It's Cantonese. So the vast majority of them came from there. And, and, and what kickstarted it was a war, the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, it started in 1850 and it raged till 1864 and ended up killing between 20 to 70 million Chinese and took place in South China. So therefore, a lot of Chinese started coming to the U.S. and they got into mining, into railroads. And before you know it, they got into conflict with white men that also wanted their, those jobs. Uh, Chinese were exposed to discrimination and racism, race riots. They were only allowed to live in very particularly marked areas and that's where we get you know chinatowns we may think chinatowns are cute and all that but chinatowns um <clears throat> have, have a very uncute history um so yeah and 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 all this led eventually unfortunately it was labor unions the the working men's association they convinced the government in 1882 to sign the Chinese Exclusion Act. And starting in 1882, the Chinese were no longer allowed to come to the United States and they were banned from becoming citizens. And this is not going to change until 1943, I believe. Other Asians would follow 200,000 Japanese, for example, by 1920. And let's not forget you know, just like there were people that opposed immigrants uh, because they thought that their jobs would be threatened, that they would drive wages down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, immigrants also contributed tons to this country. They opened up businesses, they created jobs, they created opportunities, and they also enriched uh, the cultural tapestry of this country, probably the easiest way uh, that we could see this is how they contributed to food. Okay, think about that. I bet you when you went, if you go home, if you ask your parents, hey, you know, give me some examples of American food, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers. And things. So, yeah, that's American food. You'd be absolutely wrong. I don't know what American food is, to tell you the truth. When you have a country that's been so influenced by immigrants, uh, it's hard to say. The hot dog is actually German, okay? It was introduced here by German immigrants. Uh, the bagel was introduced by Eastern European immigrants. It's very popular in Poland, particularly among Polish Jews. The pierogi is also Eastern European. That other stuff, sushi, hummus, the pretzel, German. Pizza, Italian. The hamburger, mister? Yeah, the hamburger, the original hamburger, or you mean the Hamburg steak sandwich is German in origin, not American. And I imagine a lot of people feel crushed because they thought that was really American and it's not. What we consider Chinese food in this country is more American than what it is Chinese. And it was brought here by Chinese immigrants that were afforded very little opportunities. And one of the things they did 
find a way to make some money and make a living was offering very Americanized Chinese food to Americans. And eventually you have a cuisine that emerges on its own. And then that last one, I'm going to kill you. The Cuban sandwich. I think there's few foods that are more influenced by immigrants than that one. Fun fact number one, the Cuban sandwich was not invented in Cuba. It was invented here in the United States by Cuban immigrants, but it was invented here in the United States and only partly by Cuban immigrants. Even though it has the name Cuban sandwich, it is a collaboration. It, was, it, it, it emerged from an earlier sandwich called El Mixto, which was basically a ham and cheese. And I guess they decided to get more fancy and add more ingredients to it. And it was also it was a collaboration of various immigrants that worked in these cigar factories in Tampa because that's where it was born. So you have the lechon, that's the Cuban influence, but you also have the ham, and that's the Spanish influence. And then you got Swiss cheese and pickles and mustard. What Cubans eat Swiss cheese, pickles, and mustard? That's the Jewish German influence. And then you have a grilled sandwich. You know who grills their sandwiches? Italians, like a panini. So here you have an, an immigrant collaboration in the sandwich that's called the Cuban sandwich. And it's neither 100% Cuban nor was it invented in Cuba. And it's very, very much an uh, immigrant story, that, that food in itself. So go shock your parents. And, and let's finish with talking about what could have been better. You know, a lot of the, the worst things of the American city and why they took so long to get better was because local city government left a lot to be desired for. It was indifferent, it was inefficient, and it was corrupt, just like state and national government was at that time. City governments during the Gilded Age had a lot to be desired for because most of these cities were run by what they called political machines. Machine politics and patronage um, ran city government. Political machines were political organizations led by a strong leader called a party boss and staffed by a core of loyal supporters, mostly immigrants, they, the most of the backbone of their support, particularly in New York, was in the immigrant community because they had something to offer the immigrants and the immigrants had something to offer them. They had jobs and favors and in return, immigrant votes. And these organizations would prop up people to run for office with the intent of having people in office and having people in office meant doors open, access, and privilege. Patronage was the name of the game. These political machines led by these bosses handed out favors, jobs, contracts, services in exchange for votes and political donations and bribes. They ran candidates for office who they later controlled. They were known for election rigging, voter fraud, and ballot tampering. And therefore it's not a, a great mystery, you know, why things took so long to get better for everybody in the cities is because the services were, you know, who did you end up with in office? People that didn't necessarily do their job or necessarily cared to do their job, but were there because of the privileges of the office or to see if they could get some money off out of it because corruption was a, a huge problem. Probably one of the worst case scenarios uh, was Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall was technically a, a society of uh, well-to-do, politically connected gentlemen in both New York State and New York City politics. They were, think of it like a booster club for the Democratic Party. Um, one of the worst eras and examples was the era of William Tweed or William Boss Tweed that ran Tammany Hall from 1852 to 1877. During his tenure, he ends up being the third largest landowner in New York. But the way he makes his fortune 
is by accepting bribes, kickbacks, and outright embezzling money from public works projects. He eventually was arrested and convicted of stealing anywhere from 25 to $45 million this way. Some claim it might have been as high as $200 million. And, and believe it, there were machines all over the country in every big city. And it's going to take civil service reform and a shakeup of, of government in itself and uh, effort to cut down corruption. It's going to take several decades of that before city government is finally put to work the way it was supposed to. So to summarize some of the negative effects of, of urbanization, you had corrupt political machines that took advantage of their positions in order to receive graft. They also, they also provided much needing services for immigrants and new city dwellers in exchange for their vote, but not as effective as they could have been. Unsanitary conditions. A massive wave of population entering cities helped to spread disease, make matters worse. Clean water, proper sanitation were virtually unheard of making disease even more common and poor housing housing was constructed quickly and cheaply to provide great numbers of people entering cities many tenements were unhealthy due to lack of light or sanitation neighborhoods of tenement housing became slums where crime flourished and that is the city of the gilded age in a nutshell